All right, welcome to this uh, Cilium Maintainers Track session. My name's Liz Rice. Uh, we're going to have some guest speakers today to talk about how they've been using Cilium and some updates about how you can learn about Cilium. But let's just start by saying welcome to Cilium. How many of you are already using Cilium? Pretty good show of hands. And also, put your hand up if you have contributed to Cilium. OK, hopefully next time you all come, there will be a bigger number of hands. But thank you to everyone who's been contributing. And thank you to everyone who's been using Cilium. So let's just have a quick uh, refresh on what Cilium is. Probably most of you know it best as a CNI, a networking solution for Kubernetes, although it isn't just for Kubernetes. Uh, you will probably be aware of Cilium Service Mesh and um, uh, some of the features we've been doing there around ingress and gateway API and mutual authentication that we've been talking about this week. How many of you have used Hubble for observing network packets? Yeah, I think it's one of the you know, real strong points of Cilium that you can not only connect, you know, the packets aren't just flowing, but you can also observe them with Hubble. And then finally, the Tetragon subproject. Anyone here using Tetragon? Okay, again, that's another one I expect next time there'll be a bigger show of hands. Tetragon is the project that uses eBPF for uh, runtime security, observability, and enforcement. And all of these things, of course, are built on eBPF, which is very exciting technology that allows us to change the way the kernel behaves. Did anybody come to see the eBPF documentary screening last night? It's, uh, it's so good. You really, it's a half hour of your life that you will, will not regret if you watch that documentary. It's really good. So, Tentragon reached 1.0. Give a, a round of applause for everybody who worked on Tentragon. <laughs> so, Tentragon is using eBPF to detect events which may be relevant for security purposes. Because we're in the kernel, we can detect file access or network access or changes of privilege, all of these kind of things that are very significant potentially for uh, detecting malicious activity. And the other thing that's really important about Tetragon is that those events are filtered in kernel. So it's extremely high performance. There's, uh, we've done some measurements pretty recently about the, the, the performance impact. I mean, normally when you add a, a security tool or anything that's adding a ton of observability, it might have an impact on performance. But you'll see some really low numbers, sort of under 2% CPU usage for some really um, uh, useful observability going on. So the performance is Excellent. And uh, yeah, Tetragon is 1.0 and ready for use in production. So we want to hear when you try it, we want you to tell us how you get on. We want you to raise issues and uh, contribute profiles and just tell us how Tetragon has been for you. The other, um, I guess, element, and I alluded to this earlier, is you know, Cilium is not just for connecting within a Kubernetes cluster. We have cluster mesh, which allows us to connect multiple clusters. We have Cilium mesh, which allows us to uh, connect with external workloads, have ingress from uh, external traffic, and um, essentially meet all of your connectivity needs with Cilium. And I guess that leads us on to the, the other big piece of news, and I'm sure you all know this, but I think we're going to have another round of applause for it. The fact that C Cilium is now graduated in the CNCF. <laughs> so a massive thank you to everyone who has really done anything at all with Cilium, because even just adding your company to the uh, adopters list has had an impact on this and enabled this, uh, this milestone. So uh, yeah, I think... Everyone who has been involved can be really proud. And if you're not involved yet and you're thinking, yeah, I want to be part of this, you know, rocket ship, then there is the Cilium Contributor Ladder, which lays out how you can kind of work your way into the Cilium community. 
whether that's through code contributions or non-code contributions like uh, educational material or documentation we're you know or community management we're really interested in non-code contributions as well as you know actually fixing issues and uh, adding features and if you do want to get involved you have an idea for a for a feature or you you want some advice the, uh, there's a weekly Cilium developer meeting that happens on Wednesdays, and we also now have a monthly uh, APAC-friendly time zone meeting as well. All the details for this are on the Cilium uh, README, and you also can find all this information in Cilium Slack. How many of you are in Cilium Slack? Okay. If you're not already, it's a really great... It, uh, slack.cilium.io or you find the information on the Cilium README. It really, there's a ton of people there, like 18,000 people who are interested in Cilium and eBPF and uh, it's a great place to, to share information and get advice. I mentioned this already, I, I stole my own thunder, but uh, if you haven't already seen it, definitely go and watch the eBPF documentary. And the final thing that I want to leave you with is I would like you to take a picture of this URL or scan that, URL, uh, that QR code and uh, fill in the survey and tell us about your experiences with Cilium and tell us about what you want to see next. And you know, give, us, give us the feedback that helps us to move the project along to its next success. With that, I would like to welcome James McShane, who's going to tell us about how they're using Cilium in the wild. Let's give James a round of applause. Thank you, Liz. You know, the Cilium team is really killing it at this conference. It has been, you know, you want to talk about some buzz. They've done, they've done a spectacular job in this year in their community. And I think that's what, what really drives our usage of Cilium in, um, in the wild. So, who am I? My name is James McShane. I'm Director of Engineering at Superorbital. We are a cloud-native consulting services firm, as well as offering a training curriculum. I have, am trying to resurrect the Cincinnati Cloud Native Meetup. If any of you are in Cincinnati, come find me afterwards, and we'll make it happen. I've contributed to Tecton, Argo, and Cilium, though don't go look my PR for Cilium. Um, I've done a lot of work uh, with uh, the team and uh, getting real production use cases out for uh, Cilium at a couple of our clients. So our team focuses on delivering high leverage projects requiring deep integration across multiple teams and multi in large end user environments. And for us, you know, the way that I see it, Cilium has really nailed the delivery and the maintenance across hundreds of clusters, thousands of services, and all the major Kubernetes providers, and provided for us a consistent strata on which to build network observability, network security, and it makes it really easy for us to build solutions on top of that where enterprises can trust that they are delivered, you know, delivering on top of a secure platform um, that they can build, that they can then trust their applications on top of. And this is where we really started our path of utilizing Cilium, is thinking about it from the network security perspective. And for us, this has evolved from, you know, a set of layer three, four, seven policies, now to think about, you know, security policies as application, right? This, when you think about a large multi-cluster, multi-region delivery, the key thing for us is to be able to say, hey, I've got this policy set that is its own application, right? I, I need to ensure that I you know, can modify my policies consistently, I can get those delivered across, you know, validated in a test environment, run a number of validations to make sure when I release this out into the wild for my edge release customers, that I know that I'm not gonna break their existing workflows. You know, on the back end, we observe that with uh, looking at the network flows in Hubble. But the key thing is, you know, if you've already started breaking your customers and you're seeing that, you know, the impact of that, the goal is to validate and ensure that that consistent policy set is enforced before we get there. And so by doing, treating this policy as application, it's also really useful for security teams that are, that want to know what's going on in their environments, that want to know 
how is this being enforced, they can view you know, our you know, GitOps delivery model as their place as the source of truth for how is my network being secured inside of these clusters that I deliver applications to. So it starts there when it comes to delivery because you know, we, we really want to, when it comes to these high leverage enterprise projects, they, we need to involve you know, security from the start. It's, it's that shift left mentality that Cilium is kind of at, is at the root, root of for us when we're delivering these kind of policy sets across you know, multi-region, multi-cluster environment. And then as we look into you know, the work that's been done in 2023, I really see the buzz of the project, the significant effort that's been done in the community has immediate impact for us in our use cases. I put this last, but I'll, I'll be honest, it's one of the biggest things that uh, has improved the observability and the operational aspect of Cilium for us is uh, separating out the Envoy daemon set into a separate, you know, de uh, separate deployment, separate unit. It's a very simple thing. Um, it's a separate process that's running Envoy with Cilium for the layer seven policy and management. But those kinds of usability improvements have been consistent for us as we go from, you know, I, I was here and up in Detroit last year and talking about what, you know, Cilium 110 and 111 had provided for our team. And I just see that consistent delivery going on in this project. Things like, you know, at an enterprise customers need supply chain validation for their open source artifacts. And so these things that are, are going on in the open source ecosystem are really critical to delivering, you know, secure environments that start from, start from the delivery in the repository down to the runtime security environment that you need to, um, you need to be able to monitor and you need to be able to enforce. For us, you know, when I think about the use cases that we haven't yet picked up that I'm really excited about, you know, mutual authentication is absolutely like the top of mind for us uh, as we move forward. Um, these are kind of, these are use cases that we've been asked about consistently uh, by our customers for a really long time because everyone wants this kind of transparent encryption from service to service and Cilium makes it so easy. Uh, Tom also talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation. Um, a unified uh, spiffy identity across the cluster boundary with Cilium Service Mesh is another thing that we can then utilize in other APIs to, um, to keep that use that identity uh, for all authorization mechanisms. And the BGP control plane, I know Marino talked about that earlier this week. Um, it's, it's just the, these kind of improvements are really in line with the kind of things that we have needed to see in the delivery of our applications on top of Cilium. And so for us, you know, in the runtime, it's about pairing security and observability, right? We, we put together the observability of Hubble, seeing those network flows, the process flows, you know, in that immediate nature that, that Hubble provides. And then Tetragon is the tool that we've needed for a long time when it comes down to monitoring and maintenance of sys calls. That's, that's a really a key use case. We, we were working with, uh, with a client in 2020 that, was, that wanted to do this uh, deep level integration into syscalls, and we ended up you know, using you know, seccomp policies that have been around for a really long time, but the maintenance of those types of policies, especially across um, nodes that have um, you know, le less host access and uh, you know, different host profiles, right, when you get into different operating systems and different architectures, um, Tetragon enables us to build better visibility around that that starts from, like, th that enables enforcement. By, build, by bringing that centrally and allowing us to, in, to view and query and those sorts of things, we can then build consistent policies that are, um, that enable us to, to get far more granular about the, the syscalls that these containers should do. So then, the, you know, the next steps for us with Tetragon is to bring that back and treat that policy as code in the same way. Take our network policy approach of delivering that into, you know, starting from the repository to drive those things, and we want to do the same thing in Tetragon as well. And so, the, what's next for us is very much in line with the things Liz was talking about, right? Gateway API integration, uh, Cilium service mesh with uh, mutual authentication, and then using Tetragon to make that uh, make that runtime security even more of a reality than it is today. So uh, please feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards about your end user use cases with Cilium, and we're really excited to be a part of this community.
So we'll go ahead and um, Hamanth will come up and talk about um, learning with Cilium. Thanks, James. Hello, everyone. Uh, so we wanted to take some time uh, to talk about some new parts and updates for how do we go about learning about Cilium. So a quick introduction about uh, me. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Datadog. Uh, Datadog is an observability company, and I work at a team called Compute Data Plane, which is responsible for managing Cilium for all of Datadog. Uh, we run hundreds of Kubernetes clusters and tens of thousands of nodes. I'm also a Cilium CNCF maintainer, um, so I primarily work on the SIG IPAM, um, so which is the different IPAM modes in Cilium. And I also spend a lot of time in Azure and AWS modes. Um, and you can find me on Cilium Slack or community meetings, as Liz mentioned, on Wednesdays. So uh, for this section, I want to start this off with a quick question. So how are all of you learning about Cilium these days? What are some of the resources that have helped you learn Cilium? Um, anyone? Back? <laughs> Did not expect that, but okay. Blogs, yeah. Perfect, yeah. So here's what I had in mind, right? Like documentation, talks and blogs, echo office hours, maybe reading code, running Cilium at your own company or home lab. Yeah, there are different ways. There are so many resources that you could use to learn about Cilium. But depending on your background, your own path might look completely different, right? And part of what makes it slightly tricky is that Cilium is extremely feature rich. There are lots of features. I went to the Cilium IO website earlier today, and I could not fit all of the features into one single slide. And that's how many features Cilium has. And Cilium is a very fast-paced project. This is also a screenshot from earlier today. Uh, in the last one month, we had 90 plus authors making 362 pull requests, and there were four major releases. And I can tell from our own experience, uh, it's hard to keep up with the pace at which Cilium is developing and building new features. So the community has been constantly adding lots of new features. And where I'm getting at with all this is a graduated CNCF project with as much complexity as Cilium needs a structured learning path, right? So the community has been really excited that CNCF is finally coming up with a Cilium certified associate exam. Um, and this is an entry level certification exam. And the ideal candidates would require some Kubernetes knowledge, networking background, and some hands-on experience with Cilium, of course. And this should allow uh, users to validate their Cilium knowledge and also gives an opportunity for companies to identify Cilium talent. So we are really, really excited about that. And here's how the blue blueprint looks like currently. And this blueprint was designed by a set of subject matter experts from different companies. Uh, and all of us have agreed on these topics as the uh, first topics that somebody should uh, try and understand when you're getting into Cilium. And so who's creating this CCA, right? So there are a set of 15, I think, uh, subject matter experts from different companies. We're all collaborating with each other to try and come up with uh, a certification exam. So the process is basically, uh, all of us draft our own questions, and that goes into a peer review process. And we all exchange feedback on those questions. And once those questions pass, uh, once you add all that feedback back in, it gets added to the question bank, right? So here's a sample question. Uh, I'll give you all a few seconds to read about it. Uh, any guesses? Hopefully not from the first row. <laughs> First one? Yeah. Cool. So the, the idea of the certification is it's meant to be an intro level certification. Uh, you are not required to be an eBPF expert or a networking expert because we understand that there are different kinds of engineers from different backgrounds that are all trying to learn Cilium for their own use cases. So this is meant to create a learning path for everybody 
and uh, create some structure around that. So how do we go about preparing for CCA, right? So Isovalent has done a great job at building a set of labs, and these labs have their own distinct learning paths. So based on your background, you can pick your own path and explore different labs in each of those paths, and that is a great starting point. And on top of that, there's a course from CNCF called Introduction to Cilium, and which is completely free. So check the course out. And of course, the official reference guide documentation. I know everybody says read the documentation, but nobody really does, but we should. Um, it has a lot of good content in there. And that is the official guide for uh, the entire certification. And every time we write a new question, we are required to cite things from it. So, And here's a link if you want to get notified about updates on when the certification would be released. We expect it to be available early next year, right? Yeah. So uh, what else is in store? Uh, I was told that uh, after Cilium Certified Associate exam launches, we might be working on a few advanced uh, certifications as well, hopefully, if everything goes well. And that's pretty much all I had in mind. I know all of you are waiting to hear from Thomas, so let's invite Thomas, CTO of Fisovalin. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we've heard Cilium is a fast-paced project. I have the pleasure to talk a little bit about what is next for Cilium, because we keep on hearing from you what are your challenges, what do you want Cilium to solve next for you. So let's dig in and uh, give a bit of an outlook what is planned in the next roughly six months. Of course, we will continue evolving the mutual authentication that we have released or introduced in 1.14. Um, we're not fully done with this feature yet. It's still in beta phase. We will continue to evolve this looking to hopefully market stable in 115 that is upcoming or maybe 116 depending on how fast we all write code we will of course look into fully uh, implementing gateway api as it evolves gateway api itself is not fully complete yet it has marked a, has reached a 1.0 uh, milestone, but it, we're still adding TCP, UDP route support, and the spec and the standard is still evolving. We're continuously keeping up, so whatever is being put into the spec, we immediately e implement in Cilium itself, but Gateway API itself is also still moving. I'll talk a little bit about NetKit, which was formerly called MetaDevice, or something very exciting. We can still make networking go faster. I hard to believe at this point, but we keep on finding ways to improve uh, performance. And then we also have a new Solim initiative that will briefly talk about remove the friction. So let's dive in. Um, mutual authentication. Very exciting that initially we have been able to do encryption with WireGuard and IPsec. So if you had uh, a desire to just encrypt all of your traffic, that was incredibly simple. You could enable a simple single Helm flag, enable encryption, choose IPsec and WireGuard, and automatically encrypt your entire network without actually having to uh, manage keys or uh, run an entire service mesh. So if you have been looking for purely encryption, this was a great option. But then we have also heard from many of you, you also want mutual authentication on top of that, and please without sidecars, which is why we have brought mutual authentication for the first time in 114. And we also wanted to keep it simple. So you can now use a single Helm flag to bring in an entire spiffy Spire stack. So Cilium will run a Spire server as well as the Spire agent on all the nodes and automatically generate uh, certificates for all the deployments you are running. And then you can use network policies, as you can see on the screen there, existing Cilium network policy, add two lines of YAML to require authentication, and Cilium does all the magic in the background to actually run the mutual authentication handshake. So we're trying to hide a lot of the complexity that exists when running uh, mutual authentication, which is just a necessity of, of kind of the complex inner workings of handling certificates and handshake and all of that, and exposing the user experience and keeping that as simple as possible. I talked a little bit about this Net, NetKit device, and we'll go a little bit deeper down the stack. So what is NetKit? This was called Meta Device until recently. It's a new kernel feature, and if you want to learn more about what exactly that is, 
I recommend uh, Daniel Borkman's talk about meta devices. So far, we have been kind of abusing what's, what's called a virtual Ethernet device, which is a, a software device, like a software patch cable, with, which is representing a virtual Ethernet, essentially. It's not been built at all for container use cases in any way, so we've been kind of just abusing this. So there was no actual dedicated network device that was built for container workloads. And running containers has become obviously a primary use case for Linux. So why not come up with a native network device specifically built for container workloads? Because a lot of the performance overhead for container networking was that we not only had a networking stack inside of the container, the network namespace of the container, we also had an entire networking stack outside. And so far, Stellium has been able to bypass quite a lot of that, but not quite all of it. And with NetKit, we're able to essentially remove all of the network stack overhead. And you can see that this meta, the slides are still old, so the, the, the NetKit rename kind of came after the slides were created. You can see that we can now essentially almost directly connect the network interface card of the VM or the server with the physical or with the virtual interface that's leading into the container. And I will show you what that actually means in terms of performance because it gets exciting. You can see a couple of numbers here. Um, we have in yellow the baseline. That's host networking, not running any containers. That's simply benchmarking one node, talking to another node. That's the baseline. That's what we want to get to. Then in light blue, we see the old stack, virtual Ethernet device, no modifications. And then in red, we see the prior optimizations that we have done to bypass quite a lot of that. And you can see the line is went up. We were almost as fast as host networking. And now with NetKit, we're essentially able, that's the purple, we're essentially being able to get to almost host level just from a throughput perspective. <laughs> it gets better because we can do even better here, lower is better. This means the baseline is all the way on the left. And you can see the representations, the first five on the left, that's kind of what we've seen before. If we can take it one step further, and if your application uses a kernel feature called zero copy, that is a special system call which avoids copying the data from the application into the kernel. It's called zero copy. We avoid the memory copy. And at this point, we're so fast that the, the memory bandwidth, the memory, the throughput of the memory in your server is becoming the limiting factor. If you can use zero copy in the application, you can go, you can go see it all the way down. And that's a six, like an improvement of, of, of six times in terms of performance. If you're running in particular uh, workloads like video streaming or any sort of like data intensive workloads, this is exactly what you will want. Um, NetKit is currently being merged into the kernel, and we already have a branch in Cilium to support this, and as soon as kernels are released with this feature, you can start using this. Cilium initiative removed the friction. Cilium is very feature-rich. We are trying to accommodate all of you with all your features from running a Cilium on a Raspberry Pi to uh, Datadog, clusters of thousands of nodes to heavily regulated enterprise environments, and this needs everything from encryption to high-scale uh, service mesh, all of it. Um, we are doing our best to optimize both the learning of Cilium, how you discover Cilium, how you learn about Cilium, and the usage of it, migration to it, and so on. But we have been dealing with this for such a long time, it's sometimes hard to understand what's actually hard. So I would invite all of you to, as you have learned Cilium, or if you have migrated to Cilium, if you started using Cilium, please give us feedback what was hard, because we need to know that in order to remove that sort of friction. So we've started this initiative. There's a QR code. You will also find it in the Cilium Slack. If you have any sort of input on what was hard with Cilium or what we could optimize on learning about Cilium, what is missing, please tell us, because we would love to optimize that. Sometimes it's just hard to actually know. And with that, I think, first of all, I would, to, would like to thank all of you for coming today. And if you have questions on Cilium, uh, if you want to contribute to Cilium, 
or if you just want to learn more or try it out, Cilium.io is the best way to get started. You will have uh, URL links to Slack. Um, you, can, you can find the documentation. You have the contributor ladder. Um, you have introduction material, tutorials, labs, and so on. That's a great starting point. And of course, the code is all on uh, GitHub uh, in the Cilium organization, Hubble, Tetragon, Cilium, and so on. And with that, I think we have a bit of time for questions. And um, you can open it up and ask essentially any question on Cilium. We have a lot of expertise here today. So go ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions? Yes. You, I, I can also repeat the question. The question is, how are we making money as eye surveillance? Uh, we are offering an enterprise distribution of Cilium, and if you would like to have enterprise-grade support, you can give us a bit of money. <laughs> yes. Uh, could you speak just a little bit louder? Yes, question is what algorithms are we using for mutual authentication? So mutual authentication, we're using uh, TLS of Go. So the mutual authentication handshake is using standard TLS using Golang. That's for the mutual authentication handshake. The encryption is being performed using IPsec and WireGuard. And in particular with IPsec, you can run a FIPS compliant kernel, limit the ciphers to, let's say, AES, CBC, and only run FIPS compliant ciphers, but you can use the full cipher set of, of IPsec, standard WireGuard ciphers, and on the authentication side, it's uh, go, go, go TLS. Other questions? You can also tell me about the friction of Cilium. Yes? Uh, you touched on the idea of cluster meshing earlier in the start of the sli slide. Um, uh, I tried it out. Uh, I was wondering what kind of algorithm is there to, you know, kind of selecting services for the same service but from different clusters. Specifically for load balancing? Yeah, sure, load yeah. balancing. Yeah, okay. So the question is what sort of um, algorithms are available for load balancing? Uh, Cilium offers both layer three, layer four, and layer seven load balancing. Layer three and layer four load balancing is always performed in eBPF. And we have um, round robin, we have weighted round robin, so you can send a certain percentage of traffic into one direction. We have session affinity that you can ensure that uh, for a particular client, all requests are going to the same backend. Then for layer seven, all of the routing is being done uh, using Envoy, and you have a wide variety of um, um, algorithms, uh, least connected, round robin, maglev, or the consistent hashing algorithms. Um, we also have a standalone load balancer, which can run outside of Kubernetes, that's maglev-based, performs uh, consistent hashing. We also support DSR, direct server return, so we can preserve the client IP. So I would say we are, we are implementing and supporting the standard load balancing algorithms that you will find in other software and products. I think we have time for one last question. Yes. Do we see a reason to move away from Envoy? I, Envoy is a fantastic project. Um, it, as any proxy, it does introduce overhead. So if we're talking um, XDP, BPF-based load balancer, we're talking 15 million packets per second in load balancing capacity. If you try to move that through an Envoy, that's just not possible. So the reason to not use any proxy, including Envoy, is performance. At the same time, we cannot perform all layer seven load balancing in eBPF at the moment. Maybe we will never can. Uh, that's why we use Envoy. So the reason, the motivation is performance, but in particular, things like HTTP, pa uh, parsing and load balancing, splicing connections, that's when we use Envoy. All right, I think we're running out of time. I'd like to thank all of you for coming and have a safe trip home. Thank you very much. And we have one more quick thing. We have two giant bees.
that Bill is going to set flight, set them free. So if you're lucky. <laughs> Brilliant. Safe travels, everyone. Thanks for joining us today.